What a wonderful subject we have before us concerning the angels of God and their work today and throughout history from creation. It's one of those subjects that I've already spoken to one or two of you um, before we started today. Of it's, uh, as many will know, it's been a case of cutting things out rather than finding what to incorporate with something approaching 300 direct references to angels in the scriptures and many more oblique and other references um, and phrases alluding to angels. So we're going to confine our remarks quite heavily, but hopefully helpfully uh, for us as we approach this subject. Um, Let's just notice some of the key words that we read in our introductory reading there and and just build a, a little bit of a basis. So it's all working, that's good. We're going to approach our topic this morning um, from three angles. First of all, we're going to look at some basics uh, behind angels, a little bit of um, scene setting, really, regarding angels. Then we're going to move and look at Daniel, and look at Daniel as a case study, because if God has worked through his angels, as he has, as we can see, particularly in the book of Daniel, and of course other books, um, then there's no reason to think that he doesn't act the same way. We deal with a God who changeth not. The principles are all the same. And then we want to wrap up with a few final thoughts around how God is still very much in control of events in the world, and thankfully so. Uh, Again, with reference to the second part, we're going to be dealing with angels in terms of looking at the nations rather than individual angels, though that is a wonderful subject uh, uh, and particularly uh, nice when we think about personal angels, but we just haven't got the time to go there today. So we're going to think particularly about angels with relation to the nations around and the powers in the world. So just come back with me to Psalm 103. Let's just start building up a little bit of a picture of how angels are presented in the scriptures as God wants us to understand his work through the angels. So we note, don't we, that uh, he has prepared his throne in the heavens and his kingdom ruleth over all. Bless the Lord ye his angels that excel in strength that do his commandments. You see, There's no question whether the angels do or don't do his commandments. They do his commandments. Just glance back to verse 18. You see, it's very much work in progress with us, isn't it? Whether we do God's commandments or not. Uh, Because uh, we read there, to such as keep his covenant and to those that remember his commandments to do them. Well, that's where we are. Um, But hopefully and prayerfully, we are getting better at doing commandments. But when we come to consider the angels, isn't it wonderful? They always do God's commandments. Now, what I'm going to do is build up a picture on the screen for us that I hope will be helpful um, to help us with the picture language of places like uh, Psalm and Revelation and Daniel. So we'll build up a, a picture to just really, brothers and sisters and young people and friends, just to help us stand in awe of the majesty and power of God. So we have a throne. We've read of that already in Psalm 103. And round that throne, we have angels that do his commandments, that excel in strength. And we'll look at a few references in a moment to underpin what we're talking about here. Waiting, as it were, to know what to do next on God's behalf amongst the nations and uh, individuals. So here are some references that you may um, well find coming to your mind as as we think about this with, with God's throne and the angels around. I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands of angels. All the angels stood around the throne and it's an interesting, when we start looking at such verses, it's, it's interesting to note specific words that's used in the inspired word of God. Often it's, they are described as standing before the throne or stood before the throne, waiting the command of God. 
um, thousand thousands in, in Daniel 7 ministered unto him and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The power at God's disposal to bring about his will on the earth is phenomenal. When you think of what one angel can do in the days of Hezekiah, do you recall? What was it, 185,000 Assyrians destroyed with one angel? And we're talking about thousands and thousands. And the chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. The Lord is among them. I just want us to get a picture of the, the power that should have us in awe. And we are so small, really, in God's sight, aren't we? We are very small. So let's think about these terms in, with the earth, our planet, in mind then. Here we are on this small planet that God created for us, on which we can worship him and acknowledge him as creator and his angels working to keep God's plan on track. There's approximately, just for your information, about 5,000 dots there. Uh, don't count them. <laughs> but uh, it just gives us a feel, doesn't it, of, of God and the angels working to ensure that his purpose will be done. And we have a throne, as we saw in the previous slide. And we know that Jesus, at his crucifixion, could have called upon, what was it, 12 legions of angels, thousands and thousands and thousands, if he had have wanted. And so with relation to our planet, again, our Psalm 103, the throne is in the heavens, the kingdom ruleth over all. And picking up Revelation 7 again, we see the angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth. God is interested in our planet. He has created it to be inhabited, says the prophet Isaiah. Not in vain. He has a purpose with this earth. And also, of course, in our personal prayers. What was it that Jesus taught? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven just like to pick up on that idea for a moment thy will be done and this should be our prayers shouldn't it brothers and sisters thy will be done and um, if you've still got your bibles open at psalm 103 just glance back there look at verse 21 bless the lord all ye his hosts ye ministers of his that do his pleasure Okay, that word pleasure is essentially the word will, that do his will. That's what the angels are doing, God's will. And in fact, it's translated as such um, a few times, or a number of times in the Old Testament. I'd just like us uh, to, to show you three occasions. Uh, if you come over to Daniel chapter 11 with me. Because what we're praying for is, is God's will to be done and God has revealed that in large part that will is done through the angels. And we see that actually happening. Come to Daniel chapter 11, verse 3. This is the same word as the word pleasure. Do his pleasure. Um, we can't break into the context. We know the flow of Daniel chapter 11 of the king of the north and the king of the south. Verse 3, and a mighty king shall stand up and shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. That's the same word as pleasure. Here is a king doing what he thinks is his will. Actually, it's God's will if he's allowed to do it. Um, look also at verse 16 of the same chapter. Here it is again as we progress through. Uh, but he that cometh against him shall do according to his own will. Uh, well, I'm sorry to inform him that it wasn't actually his own. He had free will, but ultimately, ultimately, it was that God wanted this to happen with relation to the king of the north and king of the south. And none shall stand before him, he shall stand in the glorious land which by his hand shall be consumed. Verse 36 of the same chapter. And the king shall do according to his will, again, 
and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak marvellous things against the god of gods and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. But what they didn't realise is that there is the most high God that is doing his pleasure, that is doing his will over the nations, ultimately to bring about his kingdom on the earth. So it's, it's just interesting how these words are used in the inspired word of God. Now, we have uh, a, a remarkable little insight into the work of the angels. It's a fascinating insight in the book of Kings and Chronicles. And I'd like us to take a, uh, like to take you there. Um, let's go to 1 Kings chapter 22. This is on the occasion with Jehoshaphat and Ahab and Micaiah, the prophet. And uh, they were discussing, well, shall we go to war? Shall we not? <clears throat> and there were disguises used. And uh, <clears throat> we know how the, the story pans out with Ahab being killed and Jehoshaphat being rescued. But I'd just like us to note again how the angels are presented in the word of God to us in 1 Kings chapter 22. And it picks up on some of the words we've already briefly thought about. So let's join the record at verse 19. 1 Kings 22 verse 19. And he said, Hear thou therefore the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne. So we've thought about that already. And all the host of heaven standing by him. So again, we've thought about some of these words. Uh, it's the picture that we've painted on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, Who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said on this manner and another said on this manner. I believe there was a conversation between the angels, the ministering spirits and God. Deciding how shall we deal with this. And there came forth a spirit. Now again in Psalm 104 that we read in our opening reading. Do you recall that they are ministering spirits. A flaming fire. And here one is. There came forth a spirit, an angel. And stood before the Lord. And said I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him wherewith. And he said, I will go forth. Again, another little phrase that's often used of angels. Gabriel, for example, I'm come forth. Um, and will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, thou shalt persuade him and prevail also. Go forth and do so. So it's, it's as if it's just drawing back the curtain a little bit, isn't it? In, in the scriptures here to say that God commands the angels and there can be a discussion about how this is going to best take place to influence the powers that be the kings that be in this case in Israel but the same process is happening today with the angels at work in the nations and it's just as another little side point with this context uh, in mind um, if you read on we know well don't we verse 34 I'm sure an angel was involved here of the same chapter when a certain man, wasn't it, that drew a bow at a venture. And uh, although the word venture can mean simplicity, as the margin suggests, actually it uh, is more regularly translated upright or with integrity. I wonder if this certain man was an angel. Perhaps, perhaps not. Certainly the flight of the arrow was coordinated by an angel if, if the man himself here wasn't an angel because it caught Ahab, of course, right between the harness, didn't it? What sort of accuracy is that? So an angel was at work here. And uh, we don't need to turn to it, but if we were to turn to the Chronicles record, what we find there is regarding Jehoshaphat. Do you remember when they suddenly realized there was a disguise going on? Jehoshaphat shouted out, no, it's me, I'm not Ahab. And they, they called him. And it says specifically in the Chronicles record that the Lord helped him. So there's an angel there. Isn't that remarkable? There's an angel involved in Ahab's death, 
And there was an angel in 2 Chronicles 18.31, if you're taking references, in saving Jehoshaphat. You see, God kills kings, removes kings, and he sets up kings, doesn't he? Just in this context of Jehoshaphat and Ahab, we can see the angels at work. Angels are described, and, and we've seen already again in the Psalms, as God's hosts. Come with me to a psalm, please. Psalm 148. Psalm 148. And we have a, a parallelism in verse 2. This is a psalm of praise to God, and rightly so. Praise ye him, all his angels. Praise ye him, all his hosts. Now again, if uh, we wanted to, we could go through all the passages, and certainly haven't the time, and look up the phrase, the Lord of hosts, where that occurs. The number of times and how many times it is referring to the angels. And it was, it was another door that sort of opened on, on, on this study, uh, considering God's work through the angels. I only want to bring and, and highlight one as a reference to this today. It's a well-known verse, but sometimes we might miss the context in which the verse is presented. So let me show... Um, this verse. It's, it's the well-known Habakkuk 2 verse 14, when the knowledge of the glory of the Lord shall cover the earth as the waters do the sea. But just a verse or two previous, you see, it's in the context of the Lord of hosts. So brothers and sisters and, and, and friends and young people, God will ensure that ultimately our earth will be covered with his glory. No, 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 make no mistake about this. Whatever's happening in the world out there at the moment, whatever's going on for us individually in our small lives, the angels are at work. The Lord of hosts, God's angels, are at work and will ensure that this earth will be filled with God's glory. And that is tremendously comforting for all of us through the troubled generations and troubled governments that we see around us. Now before we look at Daniel specifically as a, as a case study, I, I very briefly want to consider how angels work. And particularly in the light of our generation where there is, I believe, confusion around and people uh, in other churches and such like uh, suggesting different ideas. So I just want to spend just a few minutes on this. Now, it's a busy slide, and we're not going to look through all those references at all, okay, just to reassure you. We, but I just want us to get a feel of how um, God, in his wisdom and power, uses angels. And I'll briefly explain why I put um, these areas up. First of all, in creation... It's clear that angels were at work at creation, that they were involved in creation. We have places like Genesis 1, 26, don't we? Let us make man in our image. We believe that is a reference to the Elohim, the angels, and they're referred to on many occasions, Elohim, that uh, God speaks of them there. Job, in chapter 38, we know that there was joy amongst the angels at creation. Psalm 33 talks about God's word being fulfilled, and they do his commands, don't they? When God says, let there be light, there was. The angels were there. Psalm 148 again, and Amos 4. Just come to the Amos reference, please, as, as one. Because that pulls in another little theme that we've already thought about. Amos 4.13 For lo, he that formeth the mountains and createth the wind and declareth unto man what is his thought that maketh the morning darkness and treadeth upon the high places of the earth, the Lord, the God of hosts, 
is his name. That's why he's called the God of hosts there. It references to the fact that the angels are at work in his creative purpose. My question is this. If we go down an evolutionist line or theistic evolution approach, what were the angels doing? Were they just sitting about, watching it all happen in an evolutionist process? We have to answer these questions, don't we? If we don't accept at face value what the scriptures are telling us in God's inspired word. Clearly, they were there at creation, designing the exquisite and the beautiful creation that we see around us, that I know in our own publications we read about from brethren who know more about these things than I. But you see, their work hasn't stopped at creation either. The creation continues. The spiritual creation continues. So just as there was joy in that initial creation, there was joy at the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. This new creation wasn't there. And the angels joy. There's joy in heaven at every sinner that repenteth, isn't there? Still, the creation continues. The spiritual creation continues. And the angels are involved with all of this continuing creative work. And it's a beautiful feature and... Um, theme in the scriptures to follow through. Now, all, all of the other references really is just to indicate how the work of the angels permeates the whole of God's purpose. And so, if we understand how God works through angels and understand how he manifests himself through angels and, of course, supremely through Jesus Christ... We don't need this doctrine of the Trinity, do we? It's, don't need it anyway, but <laughs> you know what I mean. And you see, if we understand how God uses angels and calls them spirits many times, actually, in the scriptures, it helps us understand how the spirit does work through angelic ministration. And if we understand how God uses angels to even be adversaries, say Balaam and the ass and, and other places too, then there's no need for teachings like the Satan and devil as is taught in mainstream Christianity. Can we see how a, a robust understanding of the angels actually answers a lot of the, the questions and disposes a lot of the false teaching that is out there? So it's helpful to see how God works through the angels and indeed the return of Jesus, they're there. At the sacrifice of Jesus, they're there. At the resurrection of Jesus, they're there. In his temptations, they were there. So I just bring this to our attention just for food for thought. We're not going to spend any longer on it. Um, but just to say that an understanding of the angel helped in so many ways to appreciate the wonder of God's work. And we don't need to import false teachings. So, let us move on to Daniel. And uh, look at this prophecy as a, a case study, as I say, in angelic ministration. Particularly with their work uh, with the nations. Let's go to Daniel chapter 2, the well-known verse. Here we have uh, the image, don't we? <clears throat> Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Verse 20, Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of the God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changeth the times and the seasons, he removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. Now I'd like to just take a few moments out to examine the words and see how God presents in his word a continuing theme actually even within Daniel 
of the removal and the setting up of kings. It's a fascinating uh, little study in its own right. So let's, let's just uh, pick up on that word. He removeth kings. Come to chapter 4. I'm going to ask you to turn a few references up now. Daniel 4, verse 31. While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven, saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee. That's the same word as removeth, see? So actually now it's, it's not just an abstract statement, it's actually happening. The kingdom is going to depart from Nebuchadnezzar. There's a certain reality to it now. These aren't just words from God, his angels will bring it about. Um, come over to chapter 5 and verse 20. But when his heart was lifted up and his mind hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne and they took his glory from him. Same word, took, there. It was removed from him. Come over to chapter 7, please, of Daniel. I've got a few of these. Um, verse 12. As concerning the rest of the beasts now, so we're talking about, you know, chapter 7 represents the, the image that was there in chapter 2, but chapter 7 in terms of beasts, doesn't it? From, from God's perspective, as it were. So chapter 7 then of Daniel, verse 12. As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away. Same word in the original. Taken away. See, God removes. He removed the dominions of these various beasts, these empires. It became a re reality, and we can look in our history books and see that that is the case. Um, 7 and verse 26, again. But the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it unto the end, this great fourth um, beast again to take away that's all the same word as removeth but let's go back to verse 14 because there's one kingdom that won't be removed right in the middle here and there was given him so this is one like unto the son of man now we believe that this is as revelation chapter one points it in the day of the lord when the Son of Man, one like unto the Son of Man, that's, we believe, the Lord Jesus Christ with the saints will be judging the world. So verse uh, 14, there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, remove, same word, that will not and God's angels are there ensuring that that will be the case. So we've seen those kingdoms being removed. There's one other nice little feature of this word, final um, reference that I'd like to point you to, and it's at a personal level. Daniel chapter 3. You remember when Daniel had to uh, suffer the king's hand and was thrown in the furnace. We know the story well, don't we, from our Sunday school days. But it's just interesting how this word is used here. Verse 27, it's perhaps in an unlikely way. And the princes, governors, and captains, and the king's counselors being gathered together saw the men. You know, they couldn't believe it. Well, how is it? And they saw four, didn't they, in the furnace? And, and one looked like the son of man. And they saw these men, verse 27, upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was an hair of their heads singed, neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had, here's our word, passed on them. That smoke that was in the burning furnace hadn't been removed from that onto their clothes. You know how smoke, when we've been near a bonfire, and it gets right into the clothing and fabric, doesn't it, of our, of our clothing. Here, not even a hint of the smell of smoke 
on Daniel. And to me, that's a, a wonderful thought, because whilst God, on the one hand, can use his angels to remove empires, world empires, on the other hand, when it comes to God's servants and his beloved, he can stop a little bit of smoke affecting them. You know, the power and yet the care of God for his individual servants through angelic ministration, through that same word used. So there we are. There's the, there's the rundown of that word in Daniel, how that it becomes more than just an academic verse in chapter 2 and 21. But it has real meaning when we think about empires. So let's think of that second little phrase in chapter 2 and verse 21. Yes, he removeth kings, but he also setteth up kings. So, let's do a similar exercise. Uh, back in chapter 2 and verse 39, again, it's, it's the beginning of a sequence of references in this wonderful prophecy. So, um, the explanation of the image is given to Daniel, verse 37, Thou art king uh, of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom. Notice how Daniel expresses this. It's not actually yours. God's given it you. All right? Um, the power and the strength and the glory. Verse 39, And after thee shall arise. That's our word, setteth up. See, so, you know, you're not, you're not going to have it forever, Nebuchadnezzar. God's got things in hand. He's in control. Yes, he's given it you for the moment, but there's going to arise another kingdom after you. So you better get used to it. Okay, and after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee and another kingdom of brass which shall bear rule over all the earth. 2 verse 44. In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. Same word. This time, of course, God's kingdom under God's control. Um, 4 verse 17. This matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and setteth up, same word, over it, the basest of men. There's a debate whether that means the humblest of men or the basest in terms of depravity. Uh, the point for us today is that it's God doing the setting up. First, uh, chapter 5 and verse 21. And he was driven from the sons of men, and his heart was made like unto a beast's, and his dwelling was with the wild asses. They fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till he knew that the Most High God ruled in the kingdom of men, and that he appointed, that's the word, over whomsoever he will. Can we get the message? There's a reality to it again here, isn't there? It's God that does the appointing. It's God that does the setting up. It's God that causes men to arise, that raises up one king and removeth another. And uh, so it goes on. Let's just uh, round a few off in chapter 7 then. 7 and verse 4. The first, here we are specifically, was like a lion had eagle's wings, I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth, and made stand upon the feet as a man, and the man's heart was given, to, that's the same word, to stand, this beast was allowed, this, this political power was allowed to stand under God's hand. And uh, verse 17, these great beasts which are four, are four kings which shall arise, same word, out of the earth. I think we get the picture. That God is in control of all these empires and all these kingdoms presented to us. And I know from this platform and, and others around the country, we, we look specifically at the political powers and the empires. But our concern is how God is behind all these movements and 
brothers and sisters and young people and friends, if God is able to do that through history as he has done, there's no reason why he isn't doing exactly the same today, setting up, we might call them presidents and prime ministers now, but it's the same principles, isn't it? It's God that is bringing about his ultimate purpose so that one like unto the Son of Man with the saints will be there in the final day to rule on the earth. But there is one reference I haven't taken you to in Daniel chapter 7, which is right in the center. Right in the center there. As if we've missed the point, just in case we've missed the point. Let's look at verse 10. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand, thousands ministered unto him. You see, there they are bringing about all these changes of the beasts and the nations and the pol politics. And 10,000 times 10,000 stood, and that's the same word. Stood, set up. You see, they're set up by God to bring about his commandments, his will. There they are amidst all this change through history before him. The judgment was set and the books were open because of their work doing God's commands. So there's, uh, there's our sequence on the screen of references that we've looked at. And uh, chapter 7, just in case we missed the point, to say it's, it's God's angels at work through all these ages. What a wonderful thing. You see, God is not outside looking in. God is our God, the God of Israel. He's not a reactionary God, is he? He's not a God where things surprise him and then he has to suddenly control it or respond in a certain way. God is the cause. God is from everlasting to everlasting. God knows the end from the beginning. God is at the centre Though the average person in the street doesn't realise this. God is at the centre. And this point is nicely brought out in chapter 10 of Daniel. Now I'm indebted to the Chiasm Exchange website for this Chiasm. But it's a fascinating one. And... It's quite helpful. I wonder if you can guess what the middle verse is. I'm sure you can. But, but look, how, look how the verses do correspond. Going out from the outside, that this thing was true, appearance of a man, remain no strength in me, face toward the ground. I set my face toward the ground when he had spoken his words, when he had spoken such words, there was this understanding. And of course, it's a place we sometimes go when we think about the reality of angels working. Here it is. I knew you knew it. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. It's as if to say, God is at work. He's right at the very center of what's happening in this particular context of Persia. Where Gabriel, it would seem, was particularly at work. And this prince withstood him. And it brings a reality, doesn't it, to God's working. That it perhaps took a bit longer than, than was, was thought at the time. But nevertheless, God's will will be done. So, again, we're not going to look in detail um, at chapters 10, 11, and 12, other than to say... The theme of angelic ministration continues to bring about God's purpose between the king of the north, the king of the south, which we've already referred to earlier. But chapter 10 and verse 21, I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth, and there is none that holdeth with me in these things, but Michael, your prince. And again, it's, it's a, a, another... Rewarding study to look at Michael, the prince, and, and trace. I've put a few references there at the bottom. How Michael seems to so often be there 
uh, when it's to do with Israel and bringing Israel back to their land in particular and overseeing. He was there guiding them through the wilderness. He was that prince with Joshua when they were going to end, uh, enter into the land. And here he is again in Daniel as if overseeing the fa affairs particularly of Israel. And again, what a wonderful subject to look into. Again, the, the intricacy of the rise, for example, of, of Zionism and, and how the, the Jews are back in their land today as they are. A brother recently gave me a, a book, um, an autobiography of Chaim Weizmann and it's fascinating reading and just when you think you sort of get to grips with a good deal of how the Jews are in their land and, and you read a book like that, the intricacies of even one person, the twists and turns in their life of how they ended up where they did in Manchester and helping the war effort as it was then with his knowledge of chemistry and so on and so forth, the Balfour Declaration. and uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, but the angels are there, aren't they? Very much at work uh, under the supervision, it would seem, of Michael, the archangel, that great prince. And then um, verse 1 of chapter 11, also I, in the first year of Darius the Mede, even I stood to confirm and to strengthen him. So it would appear that Gabriel then talks about how he engages uh, with Darius, and that takes us into chapter 11 and all that happens in chapter 11. And then we join Michael again in chapter 12 and verse 1. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, Israel. And we would suggest that that standing up of Michael was probably at the time of um, the, the, the regathering, the beginnings, at the turn of the last century um, of, of Israel as they come back to land. That there was a particular purpose that Michael uh, got specifically involved again in bringing Israel back to their land. So it's fascinating to see God at work through the angels. But of course, through all of this, through all the movement of powers and empires, kings, removing kings, setting up kings, the angels are also hard at work ensuring that that way to the tree of life is kept for people like you and me under God's good hand, centered in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is now, of course, above the angels, we learn from Peter. And here we have particular reference to Gabriel to make Daniel understand the vision. That he says, I am now come forth. Do you remember that reference earlier we saw? And we find him there again in Luke, don't we? At the birth of Jesus. I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God. What, 600 years later? The angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee. And just as a suggestion, perhaps, can't be dogmatic, but I wonder if the, uh, the young man, as is described, uh, sitting on the right side, clothed with a long white right garment, was Gabriel once again. But how thankful we should be that God works to ensure that that way of redemption and salvation is there for you and for me. So when we think of the big picture again, the rulers of today around us, presidents, prime ministers, rulers, have to learn the same lesson as Nebuchadnezzar. That it's God, that it's the most high that ruleth in the kingdoms. Oh yes, they may think that uh, they have, they can just do, you know, what they like and when they like it and such like. But Nebuchadnezzar had to find out the hard way, didn't he? And as we'll be hearing the rest of this day, God willing, 
all the twists and turns of the events going on around us now. It's remarkable, isn't it? And yet God is there, coordinating ultimately all. That doesn't deny free will, but ultimately, through those ministers that do his commandments, he's ensuring, brothers and sisters, that his will will be done. So we have a few final thoughts then to just reflect a little bit on this. Come with me, if you will, to um, a proverb. Proverbs chapter 8, please. Proverbs chapter 8. It's very, very clear language, isn't it, in God's inspired word. Very, very clear, unambiguous. Verse 15 of Proverbs chapter 8. By me, kings reign. So whatever we think about who's ruling, UK, America, Russia, whatever they may have going for them or not for them, whatever the case may be, we need to accept that it's God that brings these things about. By me, kings reign and princes decree justice. By me, princes rule and nobles, even all the judges of the earth. And if we take the time to look through some other proverbs, I'll put some up on the screen. The same message recurs and recurs and recurs again. I'm not going to read them all out. I'm just going to pause just for a few moments. I hope you can see those at the back. Um, just to really consolidate that same message. Men goes about his business. Mankind goes about his business. Unknowing, by and large, that God is at work. And we, brothers and sisters and young people and friends, are so privileged, aren't we, to know that God is in control of this world. Whatever we think about the people. Indeed, um, in one of these, even the wicked are raised up for God's purpose. Just like God raised up Pharaoh in Romans chapter 9 for a purpose. You know, if we had had a say, perhaps we would have said, no way. But God needed him as part of his purpose. So we have to be very careful, don't we? The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. And we could replace that with president, prime minister, ruler, couldn't we? Ultimately, God is bringing about his will. So let's look out for word signposts, as I've called them, to the work of the angels. When, when we read through our, our daily readings, when we read through the scriptures in families, together, by ourselves, whenever, let's look out for these signposts. What, what is actually meant by the term wondrous works? What should we be thinking about? Is it just an abstract phrase? Of course not. We're talking about an inspired word. Every word in the original is important, isn't it? This is so often, if we trace that phrase actually, um, is the work of the angels. Through the Psalms. David is referring back to bring his people out of Israel. They're wondrous works, he says. I am with you. What does that mean? God with us. What does that mean? Things are determined by God. Things are ordained. Things are appointed. The determinate counsel of God. In the book of Acts. You see, it becomes clear, doesn't it, if we understand how God's angels are at work. So let's just pick on, on one word and then we're going to have to um, bring our thoughts to a close. Our horizons are very limited, you see. We have the word of God, thankfully, and we know where it's all going to end. But we don't necessarily know the process. And this is why I said earlier, we have to be so careful. 
don't we? It's inappropriate and wrong for us, brothers and sisters and young people, let's be frank, let's be clear, to get involved with politics. This has been our stand for well over a hundred years. It's inappropriate and, and, and wrong for us to become part of pressure groups, demanding this and demanding that. Or perhaps more recently, to start signing petitions whether Donald Trump should receive a state visit in the UK or not. We need to pray that God's will be done. It isn't our place to get involved with worldly politics. We have one king. Our citizenship, brothers and sisters and young people and friends, is in heaven, not of this earth. And we have to remember that, don't we, in our respective lives. See, our horizons are quite limited. This word that's translated determined, as it was determined, concerning the the uh, sacrifice of Jesus, the determinate counsel of God hath determined the times before. Let's, let's go to Acts 17 briefly. All of these come from one Greek word, and the word is horizo, which is where we get the word horizon. So verse 26 of Acts 17 and he hath made of one blood all nations of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. The times before appointed. God has determined. It's all been appointed. And then the same word, helpfully, is used in verse 31. Because this is where it's going, isn't it? Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness and how thankful we will be in that day that there will be righteousness in the earth not what we see around us today true righteousness by that righteous branch the Lord Jesus Christ by that man whom he hath ordained whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. He has ordained this, brothers and sisters. It will happen. Rest assured. Make no mistake. It is going to happen. And we're very near it, as we'll see through the rest of this day. We are very near that day when Jesus will be back in the earth. And so as we consider our smallness, we consider God's greatness, God's power, God's unlimited horizons. We know that God, as is presented to us in Psalm 90, is from everlasting to everlasting. He knows the end from the beginning, doesn't he? How thankful we should be that our God, the God of Israel, the creator of the heavens and earth, brothers and sisters and young people and friends, is in control. And we need to give him thanks for that. And pray, as Jesus taught us, that his kingdom will be here soon. Let's close with the psalm, Psalm 34. I said we're not going to have any time for considering angelic ministration at a personal level, but, well... I'm just going to squeeze this one in. Psalm 34. Because whilst we have considered the massive and awesome power of, of Almighty God, the Most High God, He is still interested in you as an individual being and me. And all those people that we hope and pray will yet come to the truth of the things of God. Let's just reflect as a final thought. To magnify, verse 3, the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. 
I sought the Lord, and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked unto him and were lightened, and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encampeth around about them that fear him and delivereth them. That's what we've got to exercise our minds on in these last days. Not questioning, not philosophizing, not bringing in false theories. Just to fear God. <coughs> and trust in him. Believe his word, that inspired word that he's given us. And act upon it. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth. Not in the princes of this world but in him, the everlasting God.